Hey, Dr. Holmig. Hi. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We are still a little bit early. I think we're still having um, different uh, audience members join in. So um, we can give them a little bit of time to file in. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to be with us here today and to talk about such a timely, uh, important topic. Oh, you're so nice. It is an honor to be here and I'm excited. This is like my favorite topic and I get to hang out with you. So life is good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so yeah. Um, uh, also to all our audience members, I just want to give a quick reminder. Um, this is the first in a series of fireside chats that Dr. Holmick and I will be hosting. So this first one is more general. It's caring for quarantine skin, which we're all dealing with. And future chats will be more personalized to your unique skin concerns. <clears throat> so stay tuned for those in the coming weeks as well. Um, and just a quick background, Dr. Holmig and I met about two years ago. Um, it was such an amazing, I remember he had messaged us on LinkedIn and I was like, is this a, a hoax? The head of dermatology at Stanford is, is messaging us, um, you know, telling us that he read about us. Um, yeah. I kind, of, I kind of stalked you a little bit. It was a little weird. <laughs> um, yeah, I had read about you guys and just like this was it. I, I've been so excited about and passionate about um, personalized skincare. I love you to sort of fit, you know, ideal skincare regimens to patients. And then it just showed up and I reached out to you and you were nice enough to, to get back with include me. So it's been a really fun journey so far. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so now let's... Um, Let's get down to it. So, you know, what would you say is the worst thing since our discussion is titled SOS for quarantine skin? You know, what is the worst thing that we can all really be doing right now for our skin? Yeah, I, I think, and I, I mean this sincerely, I think most people are either doing too little or trying to do too much. I think of our skin health in terms of our environmental interactions and then also what's going on inside of each of us. And both of those things have been completely changed in just a matter of weeks. So we have stress and anxiety like we've never had before. And then additionally, our lifestyles and our environmental exposures have been completely altered. So I'll give you some examples. You know, a lot of us are um, doing really great with hand hygiene and using um, you know, different sort of products to decontaminate our household items. And that can actually be really tough on the skin. I'm seeing lots and lots of hand dermatitis right now, just from people scrubbing and scrubbing and then just maybe not moisturizing sufficiently to maintain their skin barrier. Um, other folks want to emerge from this time you know, like a butterfly and are, are you know, trying new skin, skin products using maybe a new retinol plus a glycolic peel, you know, plus maybe doing some exfoliation and are getting this terrible dermatitis. And then, you know, another group that has popped up on my radar are so many of our patients are now transitioning to exercising at home, which I think is wonderful. And we do the same thing here. We have a Peloton at our house and I'm addicted, but um, patients don't have to go into work really anymore. A lot of, of work has done virtually. And so it's really tempting just to not cleanse the skin and not take a shower, maybe just to hang out and work out clothes all day. So we're seeing lots of acne outbreaks and other um, skin maladies due to that as well. So, you know, I think that we all have to recognize what's going on and, and do our best to adapt to these changes individually. Yeah, absolutely. That makes so much sense, Dr. Holmig. Um, so and tell, tell us a little bit about yourself too, Dr. Holmig. Why do you care so much about the skin? Well, you know, I've dedicated my whole career uh, to, to studying it. I, I'm really, you're right. I, I do care a lot and I'm passionate about it. I um, am a physician, as you know, and I am and, uh, a dermatologist. So I trained at Stanford and then um, did a fellowship in, in South Carolina and Charleston in surgical dermatology and then was back on faculty at Stanford and directed the laser and aesthetic uh, practice there for five years 
And then more recently, I was recruited to the University of Texas in Austin, and I direct all of dermatologic surgery and laser and cosmetic surgery here. So I have a really robust clinical practice. I love treating patients, and my focus really is on skin health alongside beauty, um, but, but, but really focusing on skin health. And with that, I get to do lots of cool research, exploring methods to uh, mitigate skin aging, studying the genes that actually make the skin, and figuring out how to um, how to kind of uh, play with those a little bit to reduce the risk of skin cancer and to make skin look better. So I, I love that academic aspect as well. So I, I'm, I am, I'm really passionate about, about skincare and I love getting to advise companies that make products um, such as Proven, which I'm a, a big fan of, as you know. That's wonderful. We're so lucky to have you here. And we would love to hear about some of your research topics in some of our future webinars. Oh, great. Um, I hope people will stay awake if we do that, but I'll <laughs> for hours. Um, and Dr. Holmick, tell us a bit about how many patients you've served throughout your career. Oh, dear. Quite, quite a few. I, you know, I do lots of skin cancer surgery called Mohs surgery and then uh, surgical reconstruction. And I, I think I've treated somewhere uh, around or above 10,000 um, patients surgically at this point. And then at least that and probably more patients um, from an aesthetic standpoint with, you know, lasers and, and, and other devices like that. That's amazing. And it makes me feel old, but I still love <laughs> doing it. You certainly don't look it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dr. Holming, talk to us a bit about the problems that you're currently seeing, you know, what are your patients complaining about? What is the COVID-19 quarantine situation doing to our skin? Well, I, I think it impacts uh, all of our skin differently, but it, it does impact all of our skin. So, you know, just for example, the effects of stress are, are really um, prominent right now. Stress has been, has been shown in studies to do things like worsen acne, we think that's due to uh, it elevating the cortisol release internally in our bodies, and that increases oil gland production. We also know that stress can flare eczema and dermatitis, psoriasis, um, dandruff can be worsened with stress, and even hair loss wow. can be due to stress. So there are many stress-related, what we call dermatoses or, or dermatology diagnoses that we can make where we can you know, just look at someone's skin and make a, a, a diagnosis of an illness that is an internal illness that's caused by stress. But also we just see small changes a, a, as well. So just seeing lots of that. And then as I mentioned earlier, you know, there have been changes in lifestyle. So changes in ambient humidity, uh, UV exposure, um, you know, reduced travel, changing sleep patterns, changing exercise patterns, increased screen time, all of these things play a role in our skin's health as well as its appearance. Yeah, so it sounds like really there are many enemies at the gaze, gates right now. <laughs> That's right. So let's break it down a little bit. How does the current added stress affect our skin and what can we do about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is where it gets really personalized, I, you know, and, and it kind of depends on both, you know, one's genetic makeup, uh, you know, maybe their, their background in that respect. And then also their, you know, things like their hormonal factors, you know, what their lifestyle is like. So, um, it, you know, if a patient has been, oh, doing lots of travel, perhaps, and, and then that's suddenly shut down, well, well, now they're in an environment that's completely different. You know, I live um, in Austin, and the air is quite humid here. And so our skin really adapts to that humidity in our environment. And when that goes away, as in when we're indoors all the time and we're pumping in, you know, cold, dry air, the skin barrier struggles with adapting. So a lot of our patients are getting eczema during the spring and summer. And traditionally, we think of that as a fall sort of disease because the air is drier in the fall than it is this time of year. So we have to kind of recognize where we're all coming from. Do we have acne prone skin? Do we have sensitive skin or rosacea prone skin? Do we have eczema prone or dry, dry skin? And, and sort of start really thinking about, well, what has changed with our skin and how do we best um, re reduce the problems that we're, we're experiencing due to these changes? Mm. So it sounds like personalized care is really necessary even more so now. I think so. I mean, you know, you know I'm a huge proponent of, of personalized care. I mean, 
that holds true both in, in my practice where if someone comes in and we, we perform a laser procedure or, or another type of cosmetic treatment, what we're really trying to do is, is find the best, the safest, the most effective, the most efficacious treatment for the individual. And to do that, we have to analyze their skin type, again, their genetic background, and also really look at what we're trying to treat. Are we trying to treat a sunspot? Are we trying to treat uh, blushing? Are we trying to treat wrinkles? And it's the same way with, with skincare. I mean, everyone is completely different and we need to find the targets are the goals that we're all trying to reach and then formulate products that address those most effectively. Makes sense. Um, and Dr. Holmig, so what would you say, you know, because of the current situation, we're all in front of our screens much more, we're on Zoom all day. How does this extra blue light HEV that we're exposed to affect our skin? And what could we do about that? You know, that, that has been a hot topic for several years and, and, and it's really having a moment right now because, you know, I just read a study that the average screen time exposure in our country for, for adults, I think between the ages of 20 and 39 is like 11 hours a day right now. It's unbelievable. So, you know, with, with increased screen time, and I'm talking about cell phones, iPads, computers, the, the gamut, we're seeing blue light released in, in um, our faces are being exposed to that blue light. So blue light is a spectrum of visible light that's very close to UV light, specifically UVA light. And UVA light, and also to, to a lesser but a real extent, blue light has been shown to do things like cause um, sunspots or uneven skin tone and even fine lines. So UVA light, for example, can even cause melanoma. So, you know, there haven't been, you know, incredible randomized controlled studies about blue light, but many of us think that it plays a real role in, in skin aging. Um, we know that it can release free radicals into the skin, for example, which correlate very well with uh, low levels of inflammation. Some people call this inflammaging. That's another hot term that you may hear uh, more frequently going forward. So, so I think blue light's a big deal. And um, I, I think that many uh, folks right now are not wearing appropriate photo protection because we're indoors, we're not outside. We're all starting to look pale like me, like a dermatologist. <laughs> and, and it really is important though to wear sunscreen even if we're not outside because Although we're not getting tan and we're not getting sunburns, UVA light and, and perhaps even blue light can really um, age the skin. And UVA light comes through a window glass, like in our office windows. So for that reason, we always recommend to our patients that they wear an SPF of at least 30 and, and wear that twice a day. Are you saying that even now when we are all at home uh, in front of our sitting by our desks, we should still be wearing sunscreen? Yes. I mean, I hate to say that because, you know, it, it, it's a cliche. The dermatologist never wants you to go a day without wearing sunscreen, but it's actually true. You know, a broad spectrum sunscreen can block UVB light, which gives sunburns, UVA light, and then also blue light, which what we're is what we're talking about. And we're finding increasingly that that's actually really important to maintain even skin tone and to reduce fine lines. Well, that's very timely advice. Um, and in fact, as you mentioned, uh, you know, with the paleness, um, one of our audience members um, said, you know, I look like the walking dead. That is, I have a pale, lifeless complexion from life indoors. How can I change that? Oh, dear. Well, you know, again, you may be talking to the wrong person here because I, I think that <laughs> I think that skin that has avoided the, the sun is beautiful. And if we could all live in a cave, I'd probably recommend it. So I bet that that person does not look as bad as they think, but I totally get it. I mean, I think a lot of, of us feel like we don't look great because our lifestyles have been changed. You know, things like incorporating an exercise program um, every day, a nice exercise regimen can be really helpful. It makes us look good because it brings more uh, blood flow into our skin. Like if you think about the glow of pregnancy, for example, we think that that's due to increased blood flow into the skin. Exercise does the same thing. And then, you know, if you, if you want, there, there are certain tinted um, moisturizers, sunscreens, and other products that can give you a little bit of color um, as well. I also would say, you know, look at your sleep habits. So many times um, 
small things like changes in our sleep can really uh, affect our appearance and how we feel as well. So kind of that sallow, dark, circly look is often correlated with, with a lack of sleep. So trying to get in a, in a good new routine, sleep, exercise, and a good skincare regimen as well is what I would advise that, that person. Yeah, talking about um, our uh, pregnant audiences, what would you recommend they do during this time? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's a really scary time to, to be pregnant. And I have three kids, including a very, very young one. And, and so we've been down this road, but with, with COVID, um, you know, it's an anxiety provoking time. And so first of all, stay healthy. Uh, we're not really seeing worsened effects of the virus in pregnant patients, which is wonderful. But um, there are, you know, increased healthcare visits uh, in that population, and, and increased needs to go out, um, you know, and visit places like hospitals. So, so be careful for one. Now, pregnancy alone induces major changes in the skin, and they're not all fun. I always joke with my wife that our kids are trying to kill us, and you can kind of see it on the skin sometimes. You know, pregnant patients often have acne outbreaks. They often develop things like melasma uh, or darkening of the skin, um, and that can involve the face, that can involve the body, stretch marks. So many things um, in the skin occur due to pregnancy. Um, during this time, it's, it's particularly tough because we don't want to, to get outdoors. And on top of that, there's only certain things that we can use on the skin safely during pregnancy. So, you know, we're kind of limited in terms of what sort of pharmaceutical products that we can use. So, my advice for pregnant patients is to stay safe. And, and just as we've been talking about doing the basics, you know, try to adapt your life as best as you can to all of these changes, you know, pregnancy plus the lifestyle changes as well. Um, and, and I would say less is typically more in all of us. I think that a simple skincare regimen is, is much better than a really complicated one. And that's very, very true in pregnant patients dealing with so many fluctuations in chemicals and, and, and hormones, which can affect the skin. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned less is more, you know, actually one question specifically was how many products is too many for, for my skin? Thinking of the Korean skincare routine with its numerous steps, it's putting on toner, eye cream, serum, face oil, moisturizer, a daily routine too much. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And that's one that I'm asked a lot. Now I will say everything great in beauty comes out of Korea. So I'm just going to admit that as an American dermatologist right off the bat. But the key is to pick and choose, you know, what's right for each of us. So I'm, I believe in two things with skincare. One is I think it should be personalized. And we've discussed that a bit, that everyone has a different makeup, a different lifestyle, a different environment, and needs to have different, different products. So there's no one size fits all approach. But I also believe that everyone can have a simple regimen. You know, we can really get in trouble if we're not careful by using too much. It's so common for my patients to come in with just la a laundry list of products they're using and, and be really frustrated that they're having things like, you know, scaly skin, irritated skin, um, circles around their eyes. Plus, it's expensive to have all these products and it just doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when so many product sales are just marketing driven. So, uh, you know, I like pa when patients really break things down and, and, and everyone typically, in my opinion, would benefit from you know, probably three-ish basic things. So one would be a good sunscreen, as we've talked about. I think that's important. A good moisturizer, and that can often be combined with sunscreen. And then a good, um, a good cleanser to, to get rid of makeup and gunk off the skin. And then perhaps, you know, incorporating a retinol, uh, plus or minus a, a moisturizer as well. And all that kind of depends on what a patient's goals are and what their intrinsic skin is like. But, you know, Again, I, there are many products that I, I like and, and Proven is definitely um, one of my absolute favorites because you guys do a wonderful job of individualizing these things and then breaking it down into a really simple regimen. Um, and, and I think that that's you know, really helpful in terms of you know, helping the skin and also improving compliance as well. It's just hard to use 17 products consistently the right way and oftentimes we get into trouble using them. Thank you for that, Dr. Holming. And if you haven't yet taken your personalized skincare quiz, feel free to go to provenskincare.com to get your free skin analysis. Um, and back to our um, 
the topics that we were discussing, Dr. Holmick. So you mentioned, you know, cleansing being really important uh, as one of the necessary three steps. Does that mean that even now when, you know, many of our community members are not wearing makeup, they still have to clean their face the same amount? I, you know, I really think so. I, you know, I mentioned that I made a comment earlier about exercise and, you know, throughout the day, whether or not you, you know, you have a vigorous workout or not, we collect things in our environment, even just around our houses, particulate matter, pollen, sweat, bacterial growth, all of these things occur. And plus, if you're throwing on some makeup to, to do a Zoom call or something like that. So uh, I, I really think that, that that has been a little bit neglected. I've had some patients come in with, with outbreaks of dermatitis or outbreaks of acne. And kind of when we get, get into it and, and discuss you know, what's going on in their, in their life, um, they've said, oh, you know, I, I just, the one thing that's been great is I just don't need to cleanse my skin anymore. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I think that we, that you probably should because getting those, um, those adverse you know, factors off of the skin, allowing the pores to, to breathe, um, really reduces inflammation, reduces skin irritation, reduces um, acne development, and it's just overall good for the skin. Sounds great. Sounds great. Uh, and that's an easy step to put back into our routines as well. That's exactly right. Uh, people are also reporting that they are feeling more, um, their skin is more dry, especially dry around the eyes. You had already alluded to a few of the possible causes. What are some of the things that they could do both from a lifestyle perspective as well as from a skincare perspective to improve dryness? You know that that's a good, that's a good question. Um, the I'll, I'll say that the the skin around the eyes is the thinnest skin of the body, so it's kind of a canary in a coal mine. You know, if if you're experiencing irritation around your eyes, it's it's kind of a warning in many ways that you may be doing something or maybe exposing your skin to something that's not great. The most common cause of dryness and irritation around the eyes is is just a um, a dermatitis not an allergy, just an irritant. So, you know, if patients are using too many products, as, as we've discussed, or maybe introducing a, a new harsh product, a new retinoid, um, maybe, you know, a, a, an alpha or beta hydroxy acid, those things tend to pool and collect in that really, really thin skin and cause dryness uh, as well as irritation. So that's one problem. There's also a, a risk of developing allergic contact dermatitis uh, with the eyelids as well. And that's most commonly caused by fingernail polish. Um, there's an antigen, which is an allergen uh, in fingernail polish. So if you start a new fingernail polish, be a little careful with that. And then back in the day, it used to be newspapers and magazines where if you touch those with your hands and then touch your eyelids, that would cause dermatitis. We don't really have those anymore. Right? <laughs> we have fewer and fewer because we're now online. So it's mostly fingernail polish when, when we see a true allergy. In terms of how to combat that, you know, if you can identify the cause, that's ideal because you can simply remove it. Um, and a lot of times that's just backing down on what products you're using that may irritate the skin. Um, other things that we can do are simply to moisturize that area more, visit, um, more um, vigorously with just a nice bland moisturizer. And if things really get out of control, you know, you may need to see a dermatologist because it's not uncommon for me to prescribe some sort of anti-inflammatory topical medicine for, for that area. But certainly things that have changed, you know, all of this conditioned air that we're all dealing with really dries out the skin and, and that can show up around the eyes as well. Yes. And for more from Dr. Holmig, feel free to check out his website at shelteredskin.com and to follow him on Instagram at Sheltered Skin, where he gives out tips specifically for quarantine skin and also in general for skin care and skin health. Oh, thanks so much for that shout out. You know, we've just been overwhelmed with um, this need, this new need for patients to get objective evidence-based uh, guidance on skin care, particularly during, you know, this time of the coronavirus. And so we we're trying to do that through through Sheltered Skin on Instagram and, and the website as well. So um, thank you. And I hope that we can continue to to contribute good, you know, scientifically based um, thoughts to, to this community. Absolutely. It's so necessary, especially at this time. 
Um, one more question that we have, um, you know, many of our frontline workers, and thank you all so much for your sacrifice. Um, they're working so hard right now, and they're having to wear masks all day. How does wearing a mask affect our skin, and how should we care for our skin when we wear masks? And also, what if they're experiencing more acne from wearing masks? You know, the, asking a question about how masks affect the skin um, is, is obviously very timely. Uh, we're really seeing a lot of, of uh, new things within, within that realm um, that we've never experienced before. I mean, you're th talking about hundreds of millions of people wearing, wearing masks um, overnight. It's, you, know, you know, one thing that we're seeing more of is irritation uh, in that area. Oftentimes, um, dirt, grime, and sweat will get trapped between the mask and the skin, and that can cause a dermatitis. It can cause really irritated skin and, and reduce the effectiveness of the skin barrier. It can also cause acne. We're seeing lots of what we call periorificial dermatitis, so around the, the, the orifices of the face, specifically the mouth, dermatitis and acne um, from masks. One thing to look at is, you know, what type of mask are you wearing? You know, if, you know, in, in my environment in healthcare, we are using, um, you know, surgical masks and these N95 masks that we read about oftentimes when we do surgery. And sometimes we're having to, to reuse those. And if you do that day after day, you know, you're just going to run into these issues. I'd say the, the vast majority of the population are wearing other types of masks, like homemade masks. My mom has just been cranking those things out on her sewing machine um, and giving those to her, her friends and, and actually a, a, a family practice group uh, as well in, in her hometown. And, and I know that many folks at home are, are wearing homemade masks. And I think that they're fabulous, but it's important to think about, you know, what they're constructed out of. They're typically multiple layers in those masks. And if your inner layer is something like polyester, well, that's going to trap sweat and bacteria and set off acne. Um, you know, doing something softer on the inside that's absorbent, like cotton, is often really, really helpful. And then the other thing is, you, if you're going to be rewearing these masks, it's important to clean them and wash them. So <clears throat> that can reduce the buildup of, of bacteria and other things that can adversely affect the skin, also. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, so so it seems like changing your masks frequently as well as cleaning them is important. That, that's it. And, you know, I would say with, with surgical masks, we're still in this state where we're trying to preserve them. So there is somewhat of a balance. And if you see a little redness around my mouth, you'll, <laughs> you'll know why. But, but I think a lot of this is just, you know, due to really trapping and occluding thick makeup, sweat, grime, these sort of things right against the skin. So anything we can do to, to preclude that um, is really helpful. And do they need to apply more moisturizer on their face because of it? Ah, so he, that's great. You know, do you need to apply more um, moisturizer if you're wearing a mask? It depends is the answer. It, you know, this is a personalized thing. So if you're someone that's really prone to dermatitis, to skin irritation like eczema or atopic dermatitis, yes, I would definitely um, be applying more moisturizer right, right beneath that area where the mask is seated. On the other hand, if you have oilier skin, um, I would say no. I would say actually reduce the amount of moisturizer, reduce the amount of, um, of greasy makeup that you're wearing, particularly beneath the mask, because having that occlusion will clog pores and actually flare acne. So it kind of depends on what your base skin type is. And so it's, it's, it's helpful to be sort of thoughtful about, about your approach to, to wearing masks. Sounds great. Um, and now, now let's talk a bit about at home skincare. You know, many of our um, proven members ask us what, you know, chemical peels, what at home treatments it's safe to do now that they are no longer able to, you know, go see their dermatologist or go get their facials. What would you recommend? Well, you know, I I think when we're when you're asking me about what patients can be doing at, at home for their skincare, I, there have never been more options than now, and, and I think that that is wonderful. We are living in a time where the entire skincare industry is being disrupted. 
and for good reason. You know, forever it seemed like there was just a handful of things available that, that we could access, and they were marketed to everyone with you know more money spent on advertising than on product development. There was just a few companies who who, who were into skincare. So obviously that's changed. Now you can hop on on Amazon where you never know what you're going to get and you can find all sorts of things, you know, from chemical peels to moisturizers to SPFs, cleansers, toners. I mean, it it can be frankly overwhelming. So it's wonderful that we have options, but what's really critical I think is to have good guidance about what skincare will meet your needs. Because I have many patients who are, are trying things now. I mean, trying chemical peels is really common. So like over our website, we've actually been putting together a little package. After we talk to patients, we put together packages of, of things like chemical peels to, to use at home. And we actually walk patients through how to use those. Because I'll tell you, if you're not careful, you can find things on the web that are really dangerous to, to the skin. And, and I've, I've treated some of those patients who have had terrible side effects from trying things at home. So my recommendation is, is sort of the, the same as it, as it typically is, which is, you know, consider getting some help. I think that that, that proven algorithm that we built has, has been pretty fantastic for guiding um, many folks to the right skincare products for them. But, but, but get some help and get some guidance on in terms of what would be best for your own skin. And, and then sort of try to limit the introduction of new things. So if this is a time where you're at home and you're, you're cruising along with your simple skincare regimen and you want to try something new, you know, I say go for it. But I would, I would try one thing at a time, introduce one new uh, sort, sort of product um, w- without, without bundling a bunch at the same time. Because a lot of times products aren't synergistic, they're antagonistic where using multiple, you know, can bring out their worst attributes, not their best attributes. It's very interesting. Um, what about eye cream? Uh, someone asked, what should I be using for my 75 year old, pretty good, but slightly loose around the eyes skin? You have mentioned how the eyes area has the thinnest skin. Should we care for it in any different way than the rest of our face? Yeah, I mean, you know, how, how to care for skin around the eyes is, uh, you know, a question that I'm asked every single day in my practice. And, uh, you know, I hopefully without boring everyone, I, you know, all eye skin issues are not um, caused by the same thing. So, for example, genetic changes in that area, as we age, we lose bone mass, and we also lose tension of a ligament that holds our eyelids in place. So, that can play a real factor into the, the, what we see superficially in the skin. Other factors are um, things like sun exposure. If you really stretch and spread your eyelid skin, if you're fair skin like me, you may be surprised to see how many sunspots you have in that area. Fine lines also occur in that area. We're starting with the thinnest skin of the body. And as we age, as we even hit you know, 30 years old, we start to produce less collagen. And that really shows up around the eyelids. So we see more fine lines in that area. And then, you know, sometimes we run into other funny things like allergies. There are lots of um, veins beneath the skin in that area that help sort of drain our sinuses. And when those sinuses become clogged, the veins become engorged and that can affect eyelid skin as well. So I would say, you know, we have to really consider how we take care of our eyelids in conjunction, but also separate um, from, from the remainder of our face. So with that being said, sometimes it's really helpful to get some guidance, even from a dermatologist, about why you're seeing the changes you are and seeing in your, in your peri-eyelid skin uh, in order to have a real targeted therapy. When it comes to skin care, kind of need to find that Goldilocks zone of not doing too little and also not doing too much. It's an area that benefits massively from moisturizer. You know, if you have a really dry sponge and you kind of can, um, you know, stack it next to another one or roll it up in a ball. If you pour water into it, it puffs up beautifully and really holds a nice resistance in, in, in terms of its um, surface, it becomes nice and smooth, almost like it has surface tension. Okay. If at the, on the, so moisturizer is key. On the other hand, 
if we try to do, you know, be too rough with our eyelids and say, hey, I'm having fine lines. I think I want to start a really, you know, strong retinoid. The eyelids are the first area that get annoyed and they become even more crepey. So with that 75 year old woman, my guess is that she's seeing some genetic changes that might best be addressed even with something like a filler injection or a laser therapy. But on top of that, using a nice moisturizer well suited to her skin type would be incredibly helpful. Thank you for that, Dr. Tome. Does that mean that we don't necessarily need a separate eye cream um, that a good personalized moisturizer will already do? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think so. I, I think, again, I, I'm a big believer in simplification. And, you know, there's no magic to um, eyelid moisturizers. You know, they're, they are oftentimes, at least historically, basically repackaged general purpose moisturizers with a price markup. So, you know, and some of that has changed a bit these days, but if you have a great moisturizer for that works for your skin, making sure that you apply it in sufficient amounts around the eyes will, will often do just beautifully. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for saving all of our wallets too. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of questions about acne, you know, some from young people who have acne, some from adults who have acne, others who even say that they usually have dry skin, but still have acne. Is it a, a thing of the times? What should they be doing about their acne conditions? Yeah, you know, asking about acne and its effects on the skin over decades um, is a really interesting question. I, I was recently interviewed um, by a reporter about um, an article. I think it was, the title was something like, you know, what is not fair in each decade involving the skin? And one question was, why do we get acne in our teenage years? But then also it can rear its ugly head in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. It just doesn't seem, seem fair that we survive those awkward teenage years and then, it, and then it flares up again. You know, acne is a really interesting topic. The, the wonderful thing about it is that we can almost always make acne significantly better, but it's important to have a bit of a handle on the root cause. Um, we typically think of acne as occurring due to uh, clogged pores, bacterial overgrowth, and inflammation. As we get older, some of that changes a bit. Hormonal factors start to play a much bigger role. And we see things like skin sensitivity and rosacea induce certain types of, of what we think of normally as acne as well. We can totally treat it. And oftentimes just having a skincare uh, routine that is simple and that either targets acne or targets the things that are contributing to acne, like clogged pores um, and, and, and dry and irritated skin um, can really do the trick. And it doesn't matter how old you are to take those sort of simple steps towards improving acne. Thank you for that, Dr. Holman. Um, and another question that comes up a lot too is, is about our diet. You know, we are all stuck at home or maybe snacking more than usual. Um, people are asking, how do we hide the effects of our diet um, from appearing on our skin? Or what would you recommend we do with our diets to best uh, have healthy skin? Yeah, you, you know, the diet can um, totally affect the, the skin's appearance. You, you know, the, the internal uh, is totally, you know, tied to the external. Um, and studies have shown that, for example, high sugar foods, you know, even milk uh, in, in, in kids, and then certainly things like processed sugars um, can cause eczema, can cause acne to, to worsen. You know, many of us are, are at home, you know, putting on the COVID-19. I mean, my wife and I are drinking a glass of wine and having a chocolate chip cookie every night at the end of, of putting our kids through homeschool. We need it. Um, and, and that can affect the skin. So I think doing our best to have a healthy and well-balanced diet is really important. I'd also say, you know, don't, don't um, go completely crazy with diet. So often uh, my patients will, will visit me in clinic and say, oh, you know, if I, if I have a banana or if I have a X, Y, and Z, uh, my skin really flares or my skin does better or worse. 
and I absolutely believe those patients, but there's not a lot of evidence um, that small changes within the context of a healthy diet can be harmful for the skin. So go ahead and, and, and you know, eat a good, you know, eat uh, enough calories and, and, and eat enough vitamins and minerals and, and all of that that our body needs. I think that's more important than really trying to reduce or change things. But I would say that if you're seeing something in your diet that affects your skin, well, it's worth eliminating that and maybe eliminating one thing at a time, trying to hone in on what's bothering your skin. And from a pure research standpoint, we do know that high sugar diets can really affect the skin, especially causing acne outbreaks. Now, what about water then? If we have dry skin, should we be drinking more water or how does that affect our skin overall? Well, I mean, the crazy thing about whether or not water affects the skin is that the science on it is really bad. I mean, my mom swears, you know, if she calls me on the phone when we were finished with this webinar, she's going to ask me how many glasses of water I've drank a day. So, I, you know, I don't want to, to, to step on my mom's toes or anyone's. I think that drinking water is a good idea. But believe it or not, studies have not shown that water intake really correlates with how well moisturized the skin is, believe it or not most of our, our skin moisturizer levels is due to how much water we can trap in the skin, not how much we bring to the skin through ingesting it. So if our skin barrier is, is, is good, then, then we're cruising, then our skin stays moisturized. But so many of us have dry skin, or as we age, we don't make natural moisturizing factors, and that can result in what we call transepidermal water loss, where water is wicked away and evaporates the skin. And that's really where we see um, dry skin is more of what we're doing to our skin rather than what we're ingesting. That's really interesting. And, you know, another topic along with that is alcohol. It seems that alcohol sales around the country are up. And for individual members, they're also asking about how that affects their skin. What would you recommend? Well, you know, the effect on the of alcohol on the skin is real. And, and that is, you know, I would say even separate from, the, you know, the, the question of whether, whether it's important to drink a lot of water for the skin. The alcohol has been shown to, to be harmful for virtually every aspect of our body. Um, you know, it can cause things like um, free radical development. It can cause other toxic substances to accumulate in the body. And high alcohol consumption has been shown to um, correlate with aging in the skin extrinsically as well. It's kind of funny. There was this company that um, had this brilliant idea of infusing gin with collagen and, and, and they called it collagen, which is a great name. And I was asked um, about a reporter from a, by a reporter about it at, at one point. And the, the truth of that is, is that, you know, when you're, when you're drinking to your friend's health, you're probably not drinking to your own because we know that alcohol is not great for the skin. And we also know that collagen ingested through the diet, through the GI tract, um, really doesn't make its way effectively to the skin. It's just broken down into amino acids. So I say that to tell the truth, but I also would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, thank goodness our governor has um, deemed liquor stores essential because, I, you know, if, if we didn't have that glass of wine at night, I think that my marriage would be completely on the rocks right now. Just drink alcohol wisely and in moderation. Thank you for that humanistic and scientific perspective, Dr. Holmick. We appreciate it. Of um, and in general, you know, a lot of people are just saying that their face is just freaking out in just numerous ways. You know, is there any general advice around how our skin is changing and what we can do in these, you know, weird times? Well, I, I think that that's absolutely right. I, I think that people are dealing with these changes in, in, in many different ways. Many of us have, you know, perhaps a predisposition to, to having our skin not exactly right down the middle, you know, the, the median perfect skin in terms of things like dryness, inflammation, sensitivity, proclivity to psoriasis, eczema, other types of, of dermatitis. You know, we're not all right down the middle where we, you know, we probably lean one way or the other towards developing some of these things. And I think we're seeing those manifest right now 
because we're being pushed further away from the norm towards you know the end of the spectrum just by all the changes that we're talking about just by virtue of the fact that bam we have increased stress we have increased you know anxiety and changes that we're dealing with systemically and then also we've had a complete you know 180 in terms of our our lifestyle and, and environmental exposures I don't think that there's a, a single approach that will work for everyone because each of these skin entities is different and we have to combat them in different ways. So I think that getting some perspective on what's changing in your skin is helpful towards finding the, you know, the best sort of skincare or even other treatments. You know, if you're really having a hard time despite doing things, you know, the right way, it may be time to, to visit with a professional, you know, and I, I would see a, a board certified dermatologist. You know, something like psoriasis can just explode during times of stress. We'll often see that, you know, someone um, will maybe just have a history of having a touch of skin irritation or psoriasis and then their wedding approaches. And all of a sudden with just some natural stress, they're just covered in psoriasis. And, and that really requires, you know, a visit to a dermatologist and a, a prescription, you know, sort of medicated approach. But I think for most of us, we've just gotten tilted a little bit off, um, off where we normally live, and our and our balance is just a little bit off. And so, you know, taking a an approach of modifying your skincare in, in a way that reflects the environmental changes plus combat stress will work for the vast majority of people. And so, I think that that's the good news in all of this. Thank you for that. Um, and a reminder to our audience that this is the first of a series of uh, fireside chats that Dr. Holmig and I will be hosting. So the future ones will be more personalized for specific skincare needs and skin goals, such as acne specifically or hyperpigmentation or anti-aging. So please stay tuned for those. Mm -hmm. And in preparation for our personalized fireside chats, um, what would you say, Dr. Holmig, is the benefit of personalization? Now, what is personalization in skincare, first of all, and why is it so important? And what benefits do people see, do patients see through personalizing their skincare? Yeah, you know, the, the benefits of personalization, I, I think that we've, you know, talked uh, about a lot of those. And, you know, I can expand on that even further. I, I just think that it's been inevitable um, that we progress toward personalization in all aspects of medicine and dermatology should not be an exception. I think the difference with, with my field with dermatology is that there's a major, you know, sort of cosmetic skincare industrial complex that had been dominant for a long time. And you don't really have that influence in other fields. But when we talk about personalization in medicine, I mean, we're talking about things like, you know, how do we pick targeted drugs to treat cancers for the individual? You know, how do we um, identify which patients are genetically or, you know, environmentally most prone to developing allergies or developing um, lung cancer or developing, you know, heart disease? That has been the major push in medicine it is really personalized or precision medicine. I think dermatology and skincare has lagged behind that a little bit. And I think part of that is because there wasn't a strong motivation for, for existing skincare companies to push that way. And, and plus, um, you know, it, things had been very expensive in terms of producing skin focused um, treatments and skin focused topical products. And a lot of that has changed now to where we have, you know, suddenly access to, to other, you know, many other um, avenues to to um, treat the skin and many other products. I think that's important because small things in the skin can make a huge difference. I mean, if you know, we've had obviously there are people on this webinar who are probably not sleeping really well right now. And they notice, you know, maybe dark circles under their eyes or notice things just don't look right. We had that that person talk about looking like the walking dead and small things in the skin make a huge difference. How many times have you seen a celebrity who has had some sort of plastic surgery and it's really hard to identify exactly what went wrong, but something definitely went wrong? Well, I think it's the same way with skincare. You know, we, we can't um, just hammer nails with, uh, with what we put on our skin. Instead, we need to target our individual makeup. 
you know, evaluating things like our environment, you know, whether we live in a humid environment or a dry environment, whether we have hard water or soft water, whether we see a lot of high UV index days or not, plus kind of our genetic personal makeup, um, how, how prone to irritation, how prone to dermatitis and acne our skin is, how our oil glands function. All of these things are incredibly different and incredibly diverse, which is a wonderful, beautiful thing. But the fact is that we all have different goals that we want to achieve with our skin and all of our skin is totally different. I've never seen, you know, two patients where I was just like, oh yeah, you guys are exactly like everyone's different. And so for that reason, using a skincare regimen that's still really simple because we want um, our patients to, to abide by, by their skincare and, and use it and not break the bank, but also one that targets um, an individual's makeup as well as their goals. I, I think that that is, um, is really crucial and I think that it, it's, it's the present and it's, it's the future. It's things like this that um, seem groundbreaking initially and then you look back on and they seem really obvious. I think that personalized skincare is, is one of those. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmig. And if you have more questions for Dr. Holmig, feel free to reach him at, at shelteredskin.com and follow him on Instagram, also at Sheltered Skin. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Holmig. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you in a couple of weeks in the next installment of this Fireside Chat. Uh, thanks, Ming. That was so much fun and an honor, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye, everyone.